Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Now, welcome to the second session of the Future of Electric Mobility debate here hosted by the Energy Club at Delft University of Technology. We had an excellent first session where we had the dream teams of TU Delft in the area of electric mobility debating and discussing how the technologies of today and tomorrow will look like. And now we have an excellent lineup of speakers coming in from academia, from industry, and also from the team teams going to take this discussion further. I'm your host for your second session. My name is Gautam Ram. I'm an assistant professor of electric mobility of Delft University of Technology. My research here is focused on charging infrastructure for electric vehicles and how you can power the vehicles of the future using sustainable energy like solar and wind. Also, I'm the coordinator and lecturer, one of the lecturers for the massive open online course on electric cars. We developed this course uh, with TU Delft and the partners of Dutch Insert. And we have had over 125,000 learners from 175 countries from around the world follow the course. So if you're interested in electric vehicles and even know about the technology, the policy and the business aspects of electric vehicles, you can sign up for this free course. Uh, you can see the link on the slide at tiny.cc slash ecarsx and you can follow our course. We not just have theory, but we also have case studies from different companies showing both the, the theoretical aspects, but also the real world applications of electric vehicles. So who do we have here joining us for the second session? We will have a quick round of introduction of all the speakers. And first, we will start with our speaker, Professor Power Bauer from Delft University of Technology. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Power Bauer. I'm a full professor of DC Systems, Energy Conversion and Storage. In my group, we do research on electric mobility, also on the other aspect like uh, DC microgrids, power electronics is our background. We do research especially on the charging technology, ultra fast charging, contactless charging for bikes, uh, cars, buses, also smart charging, charging from trolleybus lines. So all the charging possibilities we are investigating and it's all based on power electronics. In the group, there are around 50 people 50 researchers, and we have a really about 50 students as well. So, short introduction of my group. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bauer, for your introduction. The second speaker that we have is uh, Seep from the EcoRunner. Yeah, maybe uh, for everyone who last uh, watched the, the last session, I am Seep from EcoRunner Team Delft. And uh, with EcoRunner, we try to build the, mo the world's most efficient hydrogen powered city car. And with this, we do not only want to give a proof of concept, we want to show how uh, efficient hydrogen mobility can be, how efficient mobility should be. We actually drive uh, in, in gasoline equivalent, we drive 750 kilometers, 700 kilometers on uh, one uh, liters of uh, gasoline. So really efficient and we think the, the future of the energy transition, it's not only in uh, moving with sustainable uh, fuels and in sustainable ways, but also uh, using less energy and by of course uh, optimizing this hydrogen, hydrogen technology in our car we really want to emphasize uh, the importance uh, of hydrogen in the energy transition so uh, it's nice to be here again thank you Steve, for joining for the first session and also for the for the second session now our third speaker is Jörg from the Vattenfall Solar Racing Team yeah thank you I'm Georg um, I'm the structural engineer of the um, yeah, you can maybe see there we are um, building a new car this year, um, which is a solar car, and we are um, racing through Australia and um, aiming for the world championship there. Um, and of course, it's also um, we are aiming for the highest efficiency possible. Um, and this year, the rules um, changed a lot, so it's really exciting. Um, we're excited to also build our concept and compete and see what other teams have got there. And um, with that, we can also see what's the most efficient and best way to use the solar energy to drive. Thank you, Jörg, for your introduction and for joining the second session as well. Our fourth speaker that we have is Berthe coming from Stedin and from Eilat NL. Yes, hello. Thank you very much uh, for your invitation. My name is Bart de Brey. I work at Elat. Elat is a collaboration of Dutch grid operators. And my role is to help the company with new techniques such as uh, electric vehicles. Uh, we try to see this as a chance instead of a threat for the grids. Uh, so if you charge all the vehicles, not at the same time, but spread it evenly, 
uh, out through the night or when there's a lot of uh, solar generation, you can use the electric vehicle uh, as a buffer for the grid. Um, to, do, to do this not only for our grid, but for the whole of the Netherlands, we teamed up with the uh, other Dutch grid operators in a collaboration called ELAAT. And this is where we develop the standards and protocols. Uh, so we don't um, have different ways of charging in Amsterdam or Rotterdam. Thank you for your introduction. Um, we have our last and final speaker, and that is Tom from Lightyear. Yeah, thanks. Uh, my name is Tom Selten. I'm from Lightyear. And I was the former team manager of the solar team Eindhoven which is not a competitor of my uh, Delft colleague here, but uh, we participate in another class in the World Solar Challenge in Australia. And our aim is, uh, and I'm very happy to hear it from the students as well, our aim is to build a very efficient, actually the most efficient electric vehicle on the planet, uh, but then commercially available. Uh, we started in 2016. Uh, we were back in that time two times world champion from the World Solar Challenge. Uh, we started in 2016 uh, building a company with uh, four, uh, former, five former students from these uh, student teams and now the company has been growing uh, until uh, 150 people right now uh, so we are quite a yeah, we get quite some traction um, we actually unveiled our first prototype uh, last year a uh, year ago and now we are focusing on building the second prototype in march and at the same time we are developing our core technologies and as you can see at the picture our car is uh, captured with uh, with solar cells so we have uh, five square meters of solar cells encapsulated in the vehicle and in the Netherlands, they can generate up to 8,000 kilometers. Um, and that's because the, uh, the vehicle is super efficient. It makes use of in-wheel motors, which are quite familiar to um, my Delft colleague here, uh, because the World Solar Challenge vehicles also use in-wheel motors, but we will take the next step in commercializing this. And it's not only Eindhoven, it's also uh, the TU Delft. We have a lot of uh, uh, former students from the TU uh, working at our company, very happy with that, but also from Twente. Uh, so we really have these three universities involved in our, uh, in our company. So I'm uh, really happy to be here and I hope to, uh, to learn some, something as well from the students, uh, which we can take home and maybe we can learn them something as well. Thank you, Tav. I'm also very happy that you're here and also we have this excellent lineup of speakers. And as the title of the event suggests, it's the future of mobility, but it's a debate and also a discussion, so which means I would like all of you to not just come together on certain opinions, but I would also like to see you debate and discuss difference of opinions, because for the audience, it's very interesting to see both the good and the bad of every technology and the left and the right. And, and I really look forward to the discussion with all of you. So uh, to start this discussion, we first wanted to see what is the situation today and where we are heading out towards the future. So if you look at the numbers today in the Netherlands, we have about 250,000 electric uh, vehicles here in the Netherlands. And there's an ambitious target that we're going to move towards 1 million electric vehicles in, uh, in about 10 years from now. I think all countries around the world have similar ambitious targets that we are heading towards. So I think the first question for all of you would be, do you think these targets are realistic? Are we going to reach them? And if so, what are the challenges that we're going to face and how do you think we should overcome these uh, challenges? Maybe we can go in this round. Maybe we start with Professor Bauer. Yes, that's a very good question. Actually, uh, I try to look at the uh, class poll and try to answer it. And my estimation is yes, it is realistic, seeing that uh, the prices of the battery, which is the most expensive component at this moment, this is a bottleneck, is uh, dropping really very fast and the expectation is that in next uh, coming five to ten years it will drop even more drop even more 60 percent so this is one uh, aspect second aspect is that uh, the battery of the vehicle and the vehicle itself will play an important role for energy transition we foresee a system where vehicles will be bringing energy on demand if you look at uh, look at it uh, then such a vehicle can have a battery of 100 kilowatt hours and your house needs a peak power of a few kilowatts, but only in the evening when you cook or when you have a washing machine uh, set on. And the developments in the future are probably going to be uh, the way that this vehicle can play a very important role supplying your home for the peak power, for also storing energy from the solar energy. So it can be battery on the wheels for the house. This way it multiplies the functionality. But everything is depending on the price, of course. If the price will be uh, correctly, uh, correct and right, and the users will see also price advantage, these targets are very easily to reach. 
Thank you uh, for your opinion. Uh, what does the rest of the speakers think about this? I think a good comment made uh, by the professor is that indeed uh, you want to connect the vehicle to the house. Uh, we as Liger also look in these types of solutions, but um, they're not, there are quite many people having an, 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 a private parking spot at their house which they can connect their, their vehicle to. There are still a lot of people living in places where they have no access to a private parking spot. It's interesting to see how these people also can make use of electric vehicles without having a private, uh, a private charging uh, station uh, where they currently have one or two vehicles. Uh, and we estimate around 15% of the Dutch population, the Dutch households has actually two vehicles but no private parking spots so they have a vehicle need but they cannot park themselves too close to their home. Um, so it will be interesting to see how these charging points roll out. And we have Greg's hope, of course, that uh, with smart charging and with the availability of uh, charging stations, this will solve itself. Uh, but we as Liger, we also think we need to put radical focus on efficiency of vehicles to actually um, not plug the vehicle in every night, uh, but to make sure that you can actually drive the whole week on one single charge and then charge only one time uh, a week. Um, still, it goes hands in hand with the, with the grid, uh, but we reduce the energy need from the vehicles uh, or the, actually not the energy need, but more the need for having a charging station, especially for those who have no private uh, charging spot. Can I respond to that? Because it's, I think this is very challenging. What you said is correct, and 100% I stay behind it. But you have to be uh, to have your imagination more um, run on the very valid ideas. And the future energy system will be completely different than now. A stadium will have a different role than it has now. It will be more peer-to-peer -peer system, so the car which is parking on the street somewhere, your car will connect to this charging spot, maybe contactless charging spot, and peer-to-peer -peer will allow that it delivers energy to your house without directly connecting to your house. So this is the new business models. This is the new uh, platforms which will uh, facilitate this kind of energy uh, spreading and, and transfer. You don't have to think about the old way of energy transferring via cables from top down and uh, delivering to the houses, it will be a completely different system from bottom, self-organized, uh, very flexible and uh, on the different uh, principles. So that's what we are going to get. If you want it or not, it will be the idea of the uberization of the energy sector. It now sounds very futuristic and uh, completely unregulated, but it will, com it will completely change the whole system as we know it now. And you think yeah, yeah, a good something uh, to it. First, your question, is it realistic, uh, the target of um, uh, 2030? I think it's an undershoot. Uh, we'll be there much, much faster. Uh, this week, the UK announced that uh, no combustion engines will be sold anymore um, from 2030. Uh, so you only can uh, buy uh, electric vehicles uh, from, from that stage off. Uh, last month, the new sold cars in the Netherlands, 26% was a battery electric vehicles. So with 500,000 um, uh, cars sold per year, well, roughly 125,000 will be electric, um, maybe 2021. And that number will increase due to tax incentives, but also because inner cities will close their um, uh, boundaries for uh, combustion engines due to the nitrogen. So there will be a, a much faster uptake for um, uh, electric vehicles. And the second thing is uh, they become cheaper due to tax incentives, but also due to uh, better efficiency. And Dutch consumers are on the penny, so a, a better total cost of ownership uh, will, will help uh, this transition uh, um, the second thing is, and this is uh, where I uh, agree with the professor, new business cases will evolve. Uh, we're doing a large scale test in the city of Utrecht at this, uh, this moment with vehicle to grid, where indeed uh, we came to notice that uh, at this stage of the market, people say my car with my solar panels on my driveway. And this is where vehicle to grid comes in. It is maybe Tom's car will be charging or discharging in my street and serve your household. And we haven't figured it out yet how to solve this because it's quite complex. Your solar panels with my car and my neighbor's 
uh, uh, grid or driveway. Uh, but this is what testing is about and developing together with, with bright young um, engineers. Uh, and well, um, we're very optimistic that the coming year, these tests will run uh, next year and the year after, and we'll have some results. It's though very important that uh, the results will be adopted in new regulation to make this a success. Okay, I think this is, these are very interesting viewpoints complementing on how the future will be like. Maybe it also bring you as part of this discussion because you know as dream teams you're dreaming on how the future will be and we are now talking about 2030 and about 2040 and you yeah. probably also from your experience know that when you make such dreams there's a lot of challenges you know the nitty-gritty details are also challenging so, so what do you what are your dreams and what are the challenges that you foresee for these dreams yeah i think what we just said i totally agree actually and i think there there are still a lot of challenges but especially with blockchain technology and really the the biggest uh, one of the biggest challenges of the uh, energy transition i think will be uh, grid flexibility and uh, uh, to be able to to deliver grid flexibility on your own actually by comparing all these factors factors uh, but also with my heat pump or uh, with other uh, appliances in my home i think that's really cool and also to to uh, i also think definitely uh, electric cars will will be way way bigger than we now think because it gets cheaper and actually maybe it's not really what what maybe Lightyear is doing but also to get like a, a, a normal people cars are also uh, way more getting electric and uh, yeah I think those are big steps and why wouldn't you really when you you know that okay I'm buying a car and in probably in 10 15 years I won't even be able to enter the city why would you even buy an, an internal combustion vehicle? You're crazy, I think. So uh, I also think this will go way, way quicker than uh, maybe these uh, assumptions. Yeah, Any comments from your side as well. Um, I also think that you can still um, reach a lot by making your car more efficient. Uh, we are like you there, um, really looking into making the car, car even more efficient. You can, um, you see it already happening with electric cars, trying to make the car itself lighter, um, which m makes it consume less energy um, and trying to tackle the problem from all kinds of sides, looking at the aerodynamics, the structures. Um, there are a lot of improvements that you can see happening. We have for materials, I, I'm the structural engineer for our team, so um, you, there are a lot of new materials um, that you can use um, that aren't used yet in the usual big automotive industry, for example. And um, of course, for example, looking at carbon fiber, you always look also at the recyclability of that. Um, but they also um, actually yeah, make progress in, in trying to reuse the carbon fibers and um, especially for larger purposes, you um, there are actually some applications where you um, basically even a little bit less high performance carbon fiber will still be better than the usual solutions um, like metals that you have at the moment really. So what I'm noticing is that all of you are pretty much agreeing that we will reach these very ambitious targets. I also personally believe that we will reach these targets. There's also this open question which comes up. Maybe to summarize, underline, I think that what you said is really very important. These business models where my solar cells will power your car and uh, at the end power your house, house, and this kind of business models which are at this moment completely futuristic, not even imaginable, this will change the whole energy transition world because the sharing, shared economy, shared resources and shared loads, everything will be completely flexible. And this is what we are heading in. I think it's important to summarize this discussion from. No, Maybe I, interesting I, I, is that uh, you still need every vehicle to be connected then to, the, to a grid. But we need to have a new connectivity systems, yeah. new systems how to connect energy hubs in every street, in every uh, nearby, every uh, houses. So it will be new connectivity systems with the contactless charging, with the maybe robot arm. There are possibilities. Many if you look at the uh, for my interest, it's interesting to know how you see that coming. Like we see the electric vehicles coming, but uh, the, the charging stations are 
coming, but not that fast. Uh, Nederland is currently front runner and, and will be maybe for some some time, but not the longest time. If you see Germany coming and other countries uh, coming, in, in, but, in the numbers, yeah. Uh, but if you but look, we at, are smart. If you look at what the, <laughs> if you look at what you need. If you say okay, every vehicle must be connected to a house, uh, then you then you require actually every vehicle to be connected. And you can indeed yeah. say wireless charging, but we know now from the state of the art wireless charging still needs a lot of development to reach high powers and especially a price point and be integrated in vehicles. Now we know from in automotive industry that integrating a new technology yeah, likewise is exactly the thing. Uh, yeah, so I, I li made a, a little joke about, of course, the Netherlands is a small country and in the numbers we won't uh, uh, keep up, but we are smarter and this is exactly the thing. Uh, what we see in other markets with traditional automotive industries, America, uh, Asia, France, Germany, the automotive try to do vertical integration. So if you buy, for example, a Volkswagen, you get a Volkswagen charger with it and uh, a Volkswagen energy contract. And the same applies for, well, Tesla, Tesla supercharger. Um, and in the end, either the consumers won't take this or the regulator won't take this because where the future is where the efficiency is is the open platform the open market where new services can uh, integrate and this is why the european commission has such a big interest in the netherlands because we uh, the grid operators together with municipalities and uh, charge point industry from the start uh, tried to develop an open market. Uh, very convenient, but with one identification card, you can charge with any charger in the Netherlands. And we think roaming is a no brainer, but it's unique in the world. Yes. And it's unique because we thought about this um, avoiding vertical integration from the start. So in the end, in the numbers, we won't catch up but uh, we'll, we'll be the front runner for the coming years because we have an open market and we're a playground for new services. We're the Silicon Valley of the to, future. To know whether these business models are viable, how many charging points do you need still, if every vehicle or how many percent of the vehicles need to be connected at the same time to have a viable business model? That's yeah, I think that uh, we will see completely new solutions in the very near future. Like the energy for, hubs, for example. Energy hubs, for example, parking garages like we have here in Theo Delft, covered by the solar cells. But there is also need for the fast charging, ultra fast charging. The classical model is one car, one charger on the highway. What you will see in this parking garage in the city, one charger, 10 cars. And the systems will be yeah. dividing the power between the cars Maybe one will charge super fast because it's on the leaf. The other ones will charge slow. And you can stay, stay parking because these multiplexing systems will allow it. Share the charger. The most expensive part is the ultra fast charging system. So it will be shared. And this kind of new ideas and new, we are working on this. We have a European project to, to develop such a charging systems. But this is just an example how uh, the whole charging, uh, charging spots are uh, charging facilities and uh, infrastructure will be growing very fast and will be uh, evolving to some new solutions which we don't even know today. I think in moving forward when we, when we see this this whole transition in the mobility, you know, it's not just a technology part, right? When we okay. made this online course, we were, we were thinking always just in technology alone won't, won't get this set. We need a combination of technology, we need innovative business models, we need the government with effective policies and these three hands, if they come together, then all of us together can make this transition. And I think it's also important to mention here that the open uh, charge point protocol or the open smart charging protocol is now pretty much the world de facto standard for an open uh, protocol. And that came here uh, from the efforts of ALAD NL and all the DSOs working together. So I think this really opens up and shows how, uh, even though the numbers might not be that important, the effect is actually global and it's a phenomenon by itself. I think somewhere in this discussion, we're talking a lot about charging. And I think it's, it's important to make a statement here, and a, a rather controversial statement, I would say, is that there's always this classic chicken and egg problem. Should the charger come first or should the car come first, right? I would like to state 
but the charger must come first because I would never buy a laptop without a charger because I know I cannot use it after the second day when the battery runs out. What do you think? Should the, should the, should the car come first or the charger come first? It's integrated. <laughs> you, you need a rooster. You need a rooster. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, this is, uh, uh, we had this, uh, this issue uh, 10, 12 years ago in the Netherlands. There were no cars, there were absolutely no cars because the industry, well, Tesla was a startup just like Lightyear uh, those days. And what we did at ALAT is install just some chargers uh, to get a feeling of what, what comes across in the process of installing it. You need a building permit, you need uh, coordination with the municipality, uh, you get angry neighbors. Uh, because they want a, don't want a charger for their uh, uh, for their neighbor. So we learned a lot about the process uh, of installing it to be ready for a, for a large scale uh, rollout. Uh, we also learned about uh, the, the smart charging, delay the charging till when it's sunny and energy is cheap and uh, and green, or at night when we have a lot of load. Um, um, can shift the load uh, on the grid. But the third thing we learned, uh, and that is the chicken and egg uh, problem. We installed them, we're publicly owned, and after a year or two or three, some market companies came across and said, hey, this is our business. You're funded by municipalities, and we want to make a profit out of it. And then uh, a lot of car companies came to the Netherlands and they said, well, there are some chargers, so we'll deploy the first batch of Teslas or the Nozoe's or Nissan Leafs uh, allocated to the Netherlands because we are sure our consumers have we'll a charger. A charger. Yeah. Uh, so, well, um, uh, we helped the market a little bit, but we also um, had a, a very clear vision uh, when to stop. So when is the chicken and egg problem solved and when when can you leave it to the market? Uh, yeah, yeah. And when so, is the point? Oh, we stopped uh, in 2013 uh, installing the chargers and uh, we maintained them for uh, some years and last summer we, we sold the last one to, to a commercial party who said, well, uh, I want to, uh, to, to make use of them. Um, uh, so innovation is always good. Help the market a little bit with some subsidy or uh, public initiatives. But uh, a lesson we also learned is have your exit strategy mm -hmm. ready when the problem is solved and you can leave it to the market. Is there somebody here who thinks that the car must come first? Because if you all conclude together, the charger must come first. We can put this chicken and egg problem to rest and say the charger must come first. And we also have a practical example that that, that the system yeah, can like change the whole uh, mindset. The yeah, of that. course, because <laughs> hydrogen is really uh, is is really at the first point of where we uh, where we just uh, spoke about. Because uh, there are a lot of industries actually that that want to invest in. They want. They say, okay, we are uh, going to the zero carbon, uh, net zero carbon emissions. And we want our transport to be uh, uh, zero carbon as well. And uh, they want to invest in hydrogen, but of course there is no hydrogen infrastructure. So it, it takes such an effort right now to, to, to take that chance. And it's a big risk you are take, taking. And in heavy transport, uh, hydrogen will definitely be very important. Yeah. And uh, so you see now, and also with uh, regulations, like a, a hydrogen tanking station is like seen as a chemical factory or something. It's uh, still hydrogen tubes. Like we've got our, our Dutch gas laws that say, okay, when you're moving high, you, uh, gas through a tube, it should have this caloric, caloric values. And uh, there are so much uh, regulatory steps that have to be taken and just by, uh, growing the charging stations and then at, uh, at some point I think the, mar the market will take over and yeah. uh, I was one of the first drivers I, I'm uh, a fan of electric vehicles but uh, I was I think one of the first drivers of an um, hydrogen car as well uh, they came to the market and uh, I bought some to get some experience 
stayed in, uh, uh, was one of the participants in one of the first hydro, the first hydro station in uh, Rhone. Um, so on to experience it. And at a certain moment, very cold February morning, <laughs> I had to drive from uh, the Utrecht area to Rotterdam to fill up my, uh, 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 my tank, um, which was quite a hassle, a 70 kilometer strip, but you want to be a front runner or not. But then the uh, station was out of order. <laughs> <laughs> And since it was the only one in the Netherlands, yeah, I, I called the uh, um, Air Liquide and said, when am I able to fill up my tank again? Oh, you have to drive to Germany and to Dusseldorf. <laughs> and then, well, that's a clear example. Um, you need a good infrastructure to get somewhere. And so actually, that's exactly what Lightyear in, in the end wants to solve. So acknowledging uh, charging will be solved in, in, in Western countries and a lot of uh, countries where we have quite a high wealth. Uh, it makes sense, but if you look at countries where the grid is uh, very much underdeveloped or even absent in a lot of places and they still want to have mobility, we really believe that efficient electric vehicles in the future, having the battery prices going down, having the parts going down, having the price of solar cells going down, that driving directly on solar power will be eventually possible for them without having a grid. And yeah. then there is no smart charging. There is your car being charged by the sun. And we think that as Lightyear it's possible to achieve that point with an now and 10 years to have the first car at the price point uh, where someone in such countries and India is super interesting because of the relatively high solar radiance. Uh, we are talking already to some companies in India, Ola, for example. Um, so there is interest and they don't, have, they, they don't think about electric vehicles, uh, not yet, and they don't think about charging stations. They only think about when do I have power in, in this day because eight hours of the day they don't have power and then eight hours they have power. Uh, so it's a completely different paradigm uh, in which there are. So and we think that actually you should focus on uh, uh, the car making them efficient and let them charge themselves. So in some places the car can come first. Uh, but I really uh, in the, yeah, believe that uh, in, in, in our country the, the, the charging station uh, helped indeed to uh, make this rapid uh, uptake of electric vehicles. And that's why Lightyear is here as well, because we in the Netherlands have this great infrastructure. Yeah. Um, we benefit from that as a company as well. I think if I may ask, uh, because I think we, in the last discussion, it went quite uh, with a quite long discussion about um, also your range. I yeah. think one of the big questions was, and it kind of adds to uh, your eventual goals, uh, a question was, uh, we have 700 kilometers uh, of range. And right now, how much of this range uh, is from your battery and how much do you actually uh, get from uh, yeah, so driving through the sun? Let's complete from the battery based on the WLTP cycle because the WLTP cycle does not account for solar. Um, if you look at the solar range, it's not something we communicate uh, as, a, as, a, as a range which is communicated right now. We communicate more in, in animal range. So you would gain in the Netherlands around 8,000 kilometers having a drive cycle uh, of, a, of an average Dutch uh, car driver. Uh, for example, in, uh, in California, it's, uh, it's 13,000. In uh, India, it would be 12,000 uh, annual kilometers. Uh, you can drive on the sun. Um, and it's hard to, to really communicate it as a range uh, because it changes from place to place. Yeah, definitely. And also based on drive cycle, etc. So, uh, for example, in, in, in Australia, when we drove our car there, uh, we drove with four persons, 70 kilometers per hour, and the car was charging. Yeah, uh, and even in the city, uh, the car was energy positive because we were standing in, in, in the traffic jams and stuff. So it was actually beneficiary for us to have a traffic jam to actually uh, charge up our vehicle. It's a completely different uh, way of thinking you get when you're actually your car becomes an energy producer, and it actually also fits in uh, the new uh, business models. But uh, it's 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 for us. It's focusing on 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 another type of problem in the in the far future, <coughs> where we actually want to have electric mobility everywhere. So now when I see these different opinions, I think it's coming out like this. The charging is essential to having the car, but for some, this could mean a plug. For some, it could be in a hydrogen station, which is working all the time, and you have many of them which are accessible. And for sometimes it can mean a solar panel on top of the car, which is then providing the charging. But without this charging, it essentially renders your car useless. So we always have to ensure that this charging facility is available, it's accessible, it's reliable, it's at large so that we can have this end Mars transition towards electric mobility. Moving on, I think we, we spoke a little bit about hydrogen here. We spoke a little bit about batteries. Uh, 
And I think a lot of car manufacturers in the past, many of them bet their full money on hydrogen being the future. And now you see there's a kind of a market momentum in terms of uh, battery electric vehicles. But I personally believe that hydrogen and battery electric technology in the future may not necessarily compete, but actually complement. So which means there might be certain places where one might be the only technology which is viable. In some places, it's the other. And in some places, it's like, you know, a tough competition on, you know, who the buyer is going to go to. How do you foresee the picture? Can you give me examples of where you feel that one will be the winner and one where they would compete with each other? Uh, at this moment for uh, uh, vehicles, uh, uh, transportation of persons, uh, the winner probably is battery electric vehicles. Uh, to give an example, the rollout of charging stations at this moment, the infrastructure is at such a pace and uh, the, the percentage of new sold car, uh, they're almost all battery electric. Uh, so to keep up, um, uh, to, to close the gap for hydrogen cars, uh, it, it might be too big. However, there are uh, uh, multiple new markets yeah. Um, buses, I think they also will be battery uh, electric uh, buses, but um, long distance uh, heavy duty transport yeah. uh, might be a very good business case for hydrogen. Yeah. Um, uh, electric airplanes, um, well, the engineers in Delft, <laughs> I, I did a law degree in, in Leiden, but what I understood from aviation is that uh, when you take up with kerosene, you burn it and the airplane uh, reduces weight. Uh, so you're uh, a lot lighter when you land. If you use uh, a battery airplane, you still got the heavy batteries and you have much more G-forces. This is where hydrogen might come in as a solution uh, and air traffic can be cleaner but also uh, silent. There already is a drone, right, which a student built here on hydrogen in Dell? The Aero, yeah. I don't know too much about it, but I, I do agree and I think really... It's not it, a dream team. Uh, it's not a dream team? I don't know. Oh, I, 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 yeah, um, they started um, to build a glider as far as I know mm -hmm. um, with the really nice... Um, they wanted to yeah participate in competitions and with the special suction system to have it aerodynamically um, really good. But unfortunately, they couldn't use the suction system when participating in a normal glider. Um, um, yet. competition, yeah, yet. Yes. and the optimist <laughs> yet. <laughs> no, actually, um, they weren't allowed by the regulations because they were like putting some air out of it. Um, yeah, that's a good thing of uh, <laughs> doing a law degree in in Leiden. Uh, the law is a suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and from that they came to um, saying, hey, we still want to use it, um, and keep this technology, and then they made it a hydrogen, um, mm. say, gliding plane. Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, but to uh, at least to uh, finance, I think really it depends on every situation and what the uh, the customer or an industry or uh, whatever you're transporting. Because we said actually in the first hour we uh, did this a little bit of this discussion as well. And I think that when you compare, for example, fuel cell electric truck with a battery electric truck, and for example, I have I've got a range of 250 kilometers. Uh, the battery is the most expensive part of the, my battery electric truck and the fuel cell is the most expensive part of my fuel cell electric truck. When I want to double this range, I want to have a range of 500 kilometers, um, I, I, I do not have to change my fuel cell. I have to get an extra hydrogen tank, which is uh, not so expensive. When I have to uh, want to double my range of my battery electric uh, truck, uh, I will have to double the size of my battery and this will my, my truck will get way more expensive. It will get heavier. Uh, the sustainability, sustainability issue of uh, building large batteries is also plays a factor. So we really think, uh, yeah, with, it depends on which use, and this really changes the business case of uh, of hydrogen, I guess. Yeah. But so. maybe Professor Baba might say that our research on battery swap technology means you you don't have to have a bigger battery. You can just stop go to a robot which will give you a, a new battery and you can keep driving but maybe you can't do that, do that on a middle of a transatlantic plane that you cannot swap your batteries and maybe there are applications where battery electric might still be good enough what do you say professor Bauer? yes this battery swap is um, also one of the methods how to 
replenish fast charging uh, or how to change uh, from not, not charge to a full charge battery. And it has a business case, especially for the fleets of the lorries or trucks, which are doing daily business around the city, like uh, collecting garbage or maybe even delivering uh, food from the supermarket. And they are really working 24 hours a day, maybe, but uh, the battery swap in such a cases could be a business case, which is uh, also very profitable. You don't have to worry about the charging of the battery. We made the calculation. We have to, uh, we need only 30% more batteries than the car because pessimistic views say you need one battery on the car, one battery in the charger, and one battery prepared to be charged. So you need three batteries per car. And we made the model and we moved around the Netherlands with the same pattern as it is now. And we find out that you need only 30% more batteries than the cars. So the battery swap is really a good option. So of course, is, for the, the, sorry? So why is the reduction? Why is 30%? Because we made an assumption that you have on every 50 kilometer battery swapping station, like a charging station, and then you mm -hmm. drive around with the same driving pattern for the work, for the business, for uh, leisure. But what I wanted to say is that uh, this uh, battery swap can be a business case for uh, fleets where you have uniform cars. For normal personal cars, it is a different business model because you are not buying the battery, you are buying the charge for the battery. And this way, you have to create a completely new way of the charging and business. But for the fleet of the, of the cars, such as, for example, for supermarkets, where you have one owner, it doesn't make a difference. So you have really a very good option for battery swap, and it's better for the grid. You can apply all the smart charging principle. You have more time to charge. It's better for the driver because you exchange it in three minutes. So I think this concept which is which started already maybe 10 years ago by Better Place. Yep. This concept is not dead. It's coming back in some form for sure, but uh, it, it's now for now forgotten, but it's coming back for sure. I think um, an interesting example is that of uh, the, the car company NIO. Uh, I think they had a battery swap system in, in, in China and they did yeah. and they've done like uh, 500,000 battery swaps till day. So uh, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting technology also for electric <coughs> two wheelers and three wheelers. You can just think about just pulling out a battery, go to a, not even a, like you, you don't even, you don't even need a re robot probably. You just have to swipe a card, take a new battery, put it and you're, you're walking away. But I do see the, the benefit. I mean, we did some calculations to see how, how much batteries do we need on a Boeing 777 to go from here to Malaysia. And yeah, it's, it's too much of battery. And what about uh, transatlantic or transpacific shipping? I think these, these are areas where you need very high energy density fuels. And uh, it's still an open question whether batteries can meet that criteria or not. But there's also a middle way, which is a hybrid solution with the batteries and with the fuel cells. Yeah. So it makes sense to combine things and to have it uh, like a hybrid solution. So I think to summarize discussion, I, I would say that we see a future where uh, the two technologies will compete each, uh, will compete in some sectors probably, but for most part, they will complement each other. And there are very niches where they have their specialities and we will see both these technologies going ahead into the future. I think the economy will show us which is the winning concept. Yeah. I agree that for the heavy duty cars, for the trucks, the fuel cell is really a good option. For the personal vehicles, battery, because of the price, because of the safety, because of the other issues, uh, tank stations probably will be not allowed in the cities. You need to keep them under the pressure. It's not like filling up the regular car. You have to really pressurize it after yeah. a couple of cars. So it's complicated, but for the trucks, it's a good business model. Yeah. So. There is a completely uh, complete market for uh, battery electric vehicles and also different market for uh, fuel cell and for hydrogen vehicles. So we shouldn't really say yes or no. It's a different market. But we should say no to personal vehicles. At this moment, no. Yeah. At this moment, yeah. At this moment, no. One addition. Um, trucks and airplanes are almost constantly on the road. They're utilized all the time. Um, battery electric cars for, for uh, uh, normal persons, uh, they are parked most of the time, yeah. 23 hours a day. Yeah. And this is where an extra business case might come in. You can use them not only for mobility, but also for grid services, such as vehicle to grid. A parked car of light year um, isn't of any use for mobility. It's an energy producer yeah. and we can use it 
as a generator, but also, and that's the big bonus, as a buffer for our grid. So if not only the car is producing energy, but also your neighbor with solar panels on the rooftop, uh, we might use uh, the battery of the light year of, or any that's other car. We were invited last uh, a couple of weeks ago to also discuss that, but the issue with an OEM having a battery used as a, a grid storage is that you, the more cycles you use the battery, the faster yeah. the battery degrades. And there needs to be an incentive for the OEM as well to uh, do not have to create the battery because now we promise eight years of guarantee for, uh, for our customers. Uh, if they open up the batteries on the grid and uh, the grid operators are allowed to uh, uh, push the battery yeah. and, uh, and uh, decharge it and charge it again, yeah, the more cycles you have. Those yeah. are the conservative uh, car manufacturers. I think yeah, but still, it is, it, is, it, is, it is still an issue. I know the conservative Tesla also has the same, has the same issue. Well, um, I, I would like to oppose some of these uh, statements because the worst you can do to the battery is to fully charge it and keep it charged. Then it's aging very fast. Yes. The best what you can do for the battery is to make small cycles. Yeah, really small ones. No, really, well, I don't say how small. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to show it. But the small cycles, and it can be done uh, very, a lot of small cycles. So to use it for the grid, for regulation, for make uh, make the grid uh, more stable, it is really a business case. And of course, it has to be accounted for. But if you have a battery of the car, and if you buy it and you just have keep it in your uh, car in front of the house unused, uh, and contrary, you can make some benefit from that, some profit. It has to be only quantified and it has to be really calculated. But I believe that there is a business case also use the battery of the car for uh, this kind of good services. What I am doubting a little bit is about the yield of the light year car for the house because five square meters of uh, uh, solar cells, if you use the best solar cells of now and of today, you get top of one kilowatt peak power in a very sunny summer day. Most of the year you get fraction of that. So it's a very small power and also small amount of energy. So we have to be very honest on that. Unless you buy the most expensive cells, but then the cells, uh, the whole car is more expensive than one aircraft. So this yeah, is- If you look at our uh, watt peak, kilo peak, we have uh, 1.5 kilo peak, and that's on the STC, so the standard test cycle, which is uh, decent. It's uh, well, one- Five square meters? Yeah. It's hard to believe. Yeah, I invite you to come by. We will show you. <laughs> because it, it is. Yeah. It means that uh, one square meter is delivering 300 watts of the peak power. Yeah, yeah. If you talk to the solar cell people, they say 200 is really on the top. We are at 220. Yeah. But 300 is impossible today. Yeah. But we are at 220 per, per square meter currently. Wow. What peak? And then we have somewhat more than five square meters. I sense a field visit. I think, I, think, I think we should do that. Yeah. Maybe for the for the benefit of the audience, of, of those who don't know what is vehicle to grid technology. So what is vehicle to grid technology is that you use the battery which is inside the electric vehicle as an energy storage for the grid. So not only can you take the energy from the electricity grid and charge the battery, but you can also use this energy and send it back, which means you will need a kind of a charger which can work both ways. That the energy from the car can also be sent uh, back to the grid. Um, so I think this was actually my, my next question for this discussion was actually based on vehicle to grid. Um, I think the technology for vehicle to grid has been there. I mean, I did my own PhD on this technology. When I did it, it wasn't a new technology, right? I mean, there are chargers which can send energy from a battery back. But however, we have not seen this technology make it into the real world. What I mean is I don't find vehicle to grid chargers on the road by default, and I don't find cars which are ready for this technology. So, which means a challenge here could be partially technology, but probably it's more on the business and policy side. So, what do you think that we can do on the business and policy side, especially to kind of bring this technology to a mainstay technology that all of us can benefit from? Yeah, for um, um, for some things, uh, you need a car and you need a charger. Chicken and egg. <laughs> <laughs> Um, um, uh, what we've done uh, in one of our test labs, we, we, we checked it, uh, we developed a charger and we developed a car, uh, in this case uh, Renault Zoe, yeah. uh, bi-directional, um, and you have to make some choices, uh, AC or DC vehicle to grid. In the Dutch example, most chargers on curbsides are AC, so we want to develop an AC uh, charger and an AC vehicle to grid uh, car. 
there are also DC uh, vehicle to grid cars, mainly uh, Japanese uh, brands. But for DC, you need the inverter into the charging station, making it a very big fridge-like uh, charger with um, um, uh, cables stuck out of it. Uh, kind of a, you get kind of a Shiva in your street <laughs> if you want to charge and discharge multiple uh, um, um, cars. It's big, it's expensive, the, the charger. So this was our choice for AC vehicle to grid. So that was the, the charger. It has to have some extra specs on it, anti-islanding. So if there's a blackout and our engineer is working on the cable to solve the blackout, you, you don't want, want to have the car discharging uh, and electrocuting uh, my colleagues. Yeah. Uh, so you need an anti-islanding device. You need a bigger computer within the uh, charging station because, well, it has to do the uh, calculations uh, uh, twice to, to make it simple. Um, and there has to be extra vehicle to grid communication, yeah. uh, not one way, but uh, two ways. Yeah. And the second thing is um, you need the cars. They are waiting on the, uh, the chargers and uh, we're quite proud that the city of Utrecht said this is a successful test. We need this to shave off the solar peaks in the summer uh, and with a normal electric vehicle you can do this only once. For example, you're on a vacation, 1st of August, your battery is empty, you're parked in front of your house, you are in the south of France. You can only take off one day of solar and then the battery is full. Uh, it isn't driven for a month because you're on a holiday. Uh, and then you want to discharge the car so you can make another run. The second thing in the Utrecht business case is a very cold December or January morning when all the heat pumps uh, are heating the houses. At the same time, yeah. here smart charging yeah. doesn't apply because you are cold, I am cold, and we both turn on the heating uh, at the same time. And we should enforce the grid for this only one week a year. Uh, while with uh, vehicle to grid cars, they can help uh, shaving the, the demand peak yep. uh, on the grid. Uh, so this is the business case. And Utrecht said uh, in our tender, we're adopting uh, smart charging uh, vehicle to grid techniques. So you have to be ready with the chargers. And at this moment, there are three, 400 vehicle to grid uh, charging stations. In the, in the city and they're rolling out. And this is where the car companies uh, uh, come in. Yes. Uh, I mentioned Renault, they developed the car, but probably somewhere in the beginning of 2020, uh, 2021, uh, there will be a second commercial uh, car manufacturer who says, okay, uh, we've seen Utrecht, their showcase, uh, we're deploying cars. Lightyear can do vehicle to grid. They're not on the market yet, but also, Sono Motors, a German startup, uh, uh, will do vehicle to grid. But that's an interesting point because there are not that many cars with a vehicle to grid charger on board. While if you look at the technology of the power electronics of a charger, it's quite straightforward to make this charger by direction already inside the car. There's no additional investment for the charger. But, but, the, but if you look at the sheer number of cars and how many have a bi directional charger, it's, it's so little. So why do you think that is the case? Yeah, I think we for the student use in 2015 we had uh, we built a wireless uh, bidirectional charger because yeah, we also believe in the future you should do it uh, wireless um, to make it more convenient. Uh, but still, uh, there is I think uh, uh, it's, it's again we're talking a lot about chicken and eggs these days, <laughs> but it's indeed about having charging stations even enabling V2 grid and making sure that there is a business case and. Yeah, car, car manufacturers, they are uh, extremely conservative. I don't hope like just going to be one, but um, as we already have uh, students working at our company on, on vehicle to grid, um, not, not, not really to have the solar energy uh, generated by the car uh, pushed to the grid. Of course, when the battery is uh, full, you, you want to uh, uh, offload that energy to, uh, to the grid or to your house. Um, but mainly to indeed uh, uh, work together with, with uh, 
uh, charging stations uh, and, uh, and uh, grid operators to help actually the complete ecosystem. Yeah. We, uh, a car company without this uh, vision on, on, on collaborating with, uh, with an ecosystem, it's dead. <laughs> Yeah, I think I agree with both of you. I think the whole ecosystem for vehicle to grid needs to be created. I guess if, if 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 it's easy, the business models are in place, and anybody with a bidirectional charger of the car can can benefit from this. The warranties are in place. Then I guess more car manufacturers are encouraged. But you could also say the other way around: if all cars are coming out to be bidirectional, it's probably incentive like, hey, all these bidirectional cars are available, but they're not doing anything. Maybe we should think of a nice business model to to to, to build around this. Can I, may, uh, because do you think uh, what would be the role of the consumer in this? Will I be able to say, okay, I want to fully commit to stabilizing the grid. I want to put all my uh, uh, battery uh, uh, capacity uh, uh, to use, or is it, do I even have a choice when I have a vehicle to grid? Uh, when, yeah, of course possible? you have a choice. Uh, it's the same with the um, uh, adoption to the Corona um, uh, lockdown. <laughs> Uh, our government says, well, it, it's wise not to go out uh, to, to, to work at home. Uh, and a lot of people adopt to it. Um, so if you ask people to help the grid a little yeah. bit, delay the charging, uh, this is one way. And we did a lot of uh, consumer research uh, on this. And the second thing which helps to uh, in, uh, incentivize uh, this behavior, uh, money makes yeah. the world go round. Yeah. Um, if if you're doing the good thing, why sh shouldn't you also benefit? benefit yeah. Yeah. And um, how will this? And, it, uh, and for this, uh, this is also a, a new project for it for us. But because this is very new, you need to have the um, regulatory framework to to mm -hmm. allow um, the, the cars and part of the energy system to make a profit for the consumers. How much is that? Is it, is it already known? How, how in which ballpark figures are we talking about? Uh, uh, some Americans say you can make uh, uh, $1,500 a year, but By so Americans, yeah. <laughs> I don't trust this. <laughs> so I often, is this before depreciation and taxes and then they become silent? Yeah. But there is also a, co a company, Jetlix, who does smart, smart charging. charging. So not yeah. vehicle to grid, mm -hmm. only smart charging. And you can make, I think, 20, 25 euro per month, mm -hmm. which is Decent. in a year uh, oh, something uh, sizable. Yeah. a luxury dinner. There is a much more potential, which is not discovered yet. And uh, let's, uh, let's dream about it. So what can happen? At this moment, you read in the news that the grid has to be made heavier, maybe three to five times because of the new consumption, because of the heat pumps, because of the solars, etc. Such a car can be a game changer. Self-driving car, which is going and to connect himself, can solve the overloading of the transformers, can solve the congestion problem. Not only peak sharing. Peak sharing is the first most trivial action he can do. It can solve the overloading, it can solve the voltage problem, it can be a price related uh, charging or vehicle to grid. There are many more possibilities. It's a complex problem. But one, one thing is also very important. Putting storage in the grid on the right place, in the places where it's overloaded, can also solve the problem of the reliability. Because uh, environment about congestion, and not, not many people know, we are spending million, uh, millions of euros per year to keep the grid very reliable. And we have very good grid in the Netherlands, also in Europe. But it means that everything is uh, uh, developed twice. So there's extra transformer waiting if the first transformer is for, uh, failing. And this happens once in 20, 30 years. But it stands there. So redundancy. Yeah. Yeah. redundancy. And if you have a storage, enough storage in the grid, you don't need it. Mm. You just can say these uh, cars will supply the grid for two, three hours and we repair it in the two, three hours time. So. There is a lot of money in the circulation because of that. And these kind of business cases are not explored yet, but they are very obvious. And this will be uh, allowed by self-driving cars, which will be connecting anywhere, which will deliver the storage in the right place, energy, ease the load. So there is a lot of uh, all scale of possibility we even cannot imagine at this moment. Yeah. 
talking uh, of uh, need busy. of storage, I think we are a little bit reducing the amount of solar energy we have. Maybe we need to turn on some lights. Can you uh, can we have some lights <laughs> on here? <laughs> okay, that's good. Okay, <laughs> maybe we should continue the discussion about uh, about the use of. Yeah, uh, 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 one. Uh, um, uh, thanks for the compliments uh, on the good quality of the Dutch grids. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the second thing, uh, you're completely true. Uh, and I, uh, we at State in uh, strongly believe in um, in the new possibilities of uh, new technologies. But uh, here's where the uh, Technical University of Delft and Eindhoven and Schede come in. We need a lot of students uh, to make this work. We have some really brilliant ones. I can assure and, you and, that. <laughs> uh, well, for for uh, uh, one of the biggest challenges is not new techniques or be flexible how to implement them, but labor um, to develop this, these techniques and labor to install all the chargers and uh, maintain them. Yeah. Um, and I have a good answer for that. We are able to deliver you excellent students, but what <laughs> we need is the research projects, support by research projects, because then we have a PhDs who can supervise those students, and then the whole knowledge uh, is growing. So it's a chicken and egg problem again. <laughs> this, <laughs> this month <laughs> we had a new uh, PhD student from Delft University. Uh, to, Very good. To, uh, so yeah, I'm going to hear that. that. <laughs> uh, I think the ultimate aim of vehicle to grid is about providing storage to the grid. And there's a very controversial statement I've read on the internet, and I think I should share it with all of you. And it goes like this. Electric cars are coal powered cars. And there is some amount of truth to this, because if you look at the electricity generation, let's take the example of Netherlands, a large part of it is still coming from fossil fuels. So how do, how do I fight with this person on Twitter and, and tell him <laughs> electric vehicles are indeed sustainable and that is the way forward? Yeah, the person a, is called Trump, you shouldn't fight with him. The sad truth is a, a lot of people have this opinion and, and, mm -hmm. and it's important that we make this communication that this is a grid which is now or this is a grid in the past and we are going to move to a cleaner grid. And the question is how do we how do we do this and how do we communicate this? It's a perfect synergy, electric vehicle plus energy from the solar or wind because they are making the winning team, yes. those two together. So they should develop hand in hand and they are developing hand in hand. So this is the answer maybe to the question how it, how it is possible. Of course, if I say that we are charging only from solar from the house of your house, it's a bit uh, short uh, way to say because the whole energy mix in the country is important. It doesn't make sense no. to uh, make a clean hydrogen cars and create hydrogen by burning some fossil fuels. It is cheating actually. No. So we have to really take care that the whole country uh, energy from the sources like solar wind will be growing and it's in the planning already. Six gigawatt on the offshore, a lot of uh, solar in the cities and uh, solar parks. So it's happening already. Yeah, and so it's an energy transition. Eh? Exactly. We come from a certain stage and we go to a, a greener future. It's not an energy shift yeah. uh, from coal and from a certain day to a 100% uh, solar, uh, that's not realistic. But what doesn't help are these uh, certificate uh, issues. With. There was a news uh, today on the NOS, which state that a lot of green energy companies still... Uh, yeah, greenwashing. So, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a huge problem for the perception of these Twitter guys. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it doesn't help. Uh, and of, uh, on the other hand, uh, fortunately, we have a bright professor from the uh, Technical University of Eindhoven, out of okay, yeah. uh, who does all this fact checking. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he says, well, of course, uh, there is maybe a little bit of carbon uh, energy in, in, uh, in the whole grid load, uh, but we're getting there. Yeah, and yeah. even if you drive, uh, fully on coal uh, power, which isn't recommended, but still then the car is it's cheaper, not only for greenhouse gases, but as I mentioned before, uh, at this moment we're in a, a nitrogen crisis in the Netherlands. Mm. Yeah. And uh, that's also a, a big challenge. There might be some link between air pollution, fine particles and COVID. 
uh, and you don't emit all those. Yeah, I, I think I agree with all, all of you. Um, it, it, my usual response to you know this kind of criticism is just always that you know you have to look at the whole big picture. You know, look at the whole well to wheel emissions, right, from where you take the oil or where you take the coal and produce electricity all the way to your wheel. And also, it's very important to realize that if the, if the problem of climate change, if you're going to continue with uh, use of fossil fuels, it will never get solved. But at least moving to electric mobility and to have solar and wind and storage both on a day to day and a seasonal level, that means we have a solution. It's probably not there today, but a solution that we can reach to and realize this transition. And I think uh, all of you are working in your own ways to help in this transition to, to, to be realized. Yeah. And the, the, the... Uh, the cobalt and the lithium will become another issue yeah. Yeah, for the, which you for need the batteries. For, for the batteries and yeah. of course the labor conditions in the countries where they come from yeah. are, are so so poor it breaks your heart and we uh, and the next stage is we have to solve those as well i think maybe tu delft technology we actually discussed before like with the cobalt issue of course and uh, I think the, the, the students of today, they have to find out like when we are upscaling these batteries, uh, what is going to be the net, next thing? We can't power the entire world on lithium ion batteries. That's almost a, a given fact. And also to add to the to the other discussion, I think really why electrical vehicles are better. It's, it's very easy because my internal combustion uh, vehicle is like 20% efficient and yeah. my electric vehicle is 80% efficient. When I have a, a gas plant, only when I'm fully powered on gas, that is 60% efficient. I still have a, I'm still more sustainable driving my electric car. Plus, I don't have all these uh, nitrogen and uh, emissions in the city, so it's it's very uh, it's very easy. I often joke an engine is extremely efficient, 80% efficient in producing heat. <laughs> and as a byproduct, you could also have some movement, you know, using that. Um, in view of time, I would like to close uh, this open discussion with, with, with one question, and that is kind of looking into the future, because we have the dream teams, you know, building this innovation uh, technologies, and we have Lightning, which kind of transitioned from being a, a dream team in, 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 in TY and Owen to, to a kind of a, a, a commercial venture where we can bring your technology to the masses. So maybe between the dream teams and, and, and Lightyear, the question is, how much of the technology is developed will remain within these research endeavors and how much of it will come to the real world and how easy or difficult is this transition? Because ultimately, I as a user want to benefit from your technology. Of course, I love clapping my hands and, and you know, jumping in joy when you win the races. At the same time, I also want to probably drive my own racing uh, car, which is powered from solar. So how do you foresee that? Yeah, good question. So we started uh, now four years ago already. And if you look at where we are right now, we can be quite proud, I guess, where we are. Uh, at the same time, uh, there is still a lot of skepticism about using solar on on our vehicles, uh, and we should um, uh, get rid of that skepticism and make sure that we can uh, can get rid of it. And that's where the student teams are really of great help to really show that that there is a huge potential. And they do it, of course, in ideal situation in Australia and. The car of Nuna is super sleek and uh, will be really sleek, right, this year as well? <laughs> uh, I won't reveal anything yet, okay. but it's, <laughs> it's going um, to be yeah, good. Of course, yeah. it will be the... It's going to be sleek, yeah. yeah. Let me know. <laughs> but the transition is is, uh, is hard. You know, you have to... Uh, uh, it's easy as a technical student to uh, to accept a job offer from the lots of companies you get offered the job by because, yeah, uh, there is a lot of companies willing to have your working there and you need to start yourself uh, without having uh, a decent income in the beginning, without having uh, a clear idea on, on on how you're going to do the, how the next step looks like because yeah, on, on the university you don't learn how to build a company, you learn how to develop technology and be a good engineer and do uh, decent research, but you don't learn how to re raise a company and that's something we really need help as students to, to uh, build these companies and to um, yeah, to bring it to the to the market, you you have to face a customer, and many yeah. of the engineers at the university never saw a customer. Oh yeah, it's of course, but they never thought of a customer before, yeah. and uh, uh, they, they have uh, loads of irrationalities why, for example, solar on vehicles is not a good idea, and, and, and you have to face that, and you have to to find solutions for that, and uh, of course we have uh, you need a huge capital uh, as Niger. Um, but we started small, you know, we started just at the kitchen table with the five of us and uh, step by step the company has been created. So I would encourage all the teams to 
to really start thinking about uh, um, developing that technology in, in their own company. And I think that's also an encouragement for all the, all the audience. We have a lot of students who are joining for the show. Yeah, we can really change the world, you know, you if can, you have yeah. your ideas and you can uh, make this transition. Yeah, I, I think we also just had the discussion about um, the cobalt or the lithium ion um, batteries based on cobalt. And actually, um, we're also looking into different um, options of batteries, um, which are also more sustainable. Um, and I think that's exactly where the dream teams also can come in. We, um, we research all those possibilities. We look, try in our research um, project, um, we um, implement them. And then we can also give an example into how well it works. Um, and in the end, um, the best example or the best um, solution will probably have more, um, yeah, more people will see it. And um, besides that, also ourselves or the students, um, when we then enter the market later on, we know it's like it's there um, and we, yeah, that's I think also carrying on this knowledge um, helps a lot there. And I, I think uh, also going back to your question, like how many IDs are actually going to become companies or going to be the thing? I think really because we're so used to uh, centralized energy production and big solutions, uh, I think the energy transition is way more uh, complicated. And I think yeah. all these solutions need to work together and they all can do it on their own. And really all these uh, sustainable energy solutions, they all have uh, uh, something that backfires. And uh, either for the uh, uh, <laughs> Dutch saying, uh, uh, and we all, uh, and we all these, uh, uh, all these new problems and also problems later on in the energy transition, uh, decarbonizing the really hard to decarbonize sectors. There's so many issues uh, which just need a lot more solutions. And maybe some solutions are better, but uh, I think we all agree that it's quite urgent. Yeah. So we just have to shoot at all these solutions and we have to, 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 to try and maybe missing sometimes is, is, uh, is, is definitely not so bad because we, we do need to shoot because yeah. otherwise nothing is going to happen. So definitely, yeah. I think more uh, solutions or ideas than you think will actually get there and, and become important. Or maybe we even might have to reimagine existing solutions. So often people ask me, do you own an electric car? And I say, I use a bike and then the bike <laughs> is far more sustainable. I would say maybe in a lot of countries, you probably people have to bike more rather than buying electric cars, right? That's probably, so this is a solution which is already there, but it's kind of how we think uh, at the problem. So yeah, so thank you very much for, uh, for, for this uh, interesting discussion. We will have some questions from the audience. Uh, so please feel free to uh, put in your questions in the chat box. Um, I don't think we'll be able to answer all the questions, but we, I, I see that we have some questions as of now. Uh, maybe there's a question for Professor Bauer and for Werther. And this question is, um, do you think our electricity grid is able to accommodate the electric vehicles that are expected in the future? Yeah. And, and, and what, are, what can we do to facilitate this integration? We, uh, we did some uh, calculations um, on this and there is enough grid capacity, but we have to apply smart charging. If we yeah. all charge at the same time, we'll have an overload. Uh, but if we spread the load, um, the grid even can benefit from all the electric vehicles. But in total, for every car becoming electric uh, in the Netherlands, Buses, heavy duty, 100% uh, uptake, and there's enough capacity. So uh, I would like to agree with this. Of course, maybe the first statement is it's not a problem of energy because we are spending, we are consuming about 125 terawatt hour of electrical energy per year, and uh, 1 million cars will mean only 5% increase of energy needs. Yeah. It's more uh, the problem of the congestion. That's why we need the smart charging. And I like to compare it with the cars driving on the roads, because if you calculate the amount of the cars and the amount of the asphalt in the Netherlands, you come to the conclusion that every car can really drive on the roads safely with the distance between the cars. Yet in the reality, you get congestions. Exactly the same will happen also with the charging. That's why we need to have it controlled. The traffic you cannot control so easily, but Charging, you can control it much easier. Of course, it demands completely different business models, 
different attitude. It will be, that's why I call it uh, peer to peer or Uberization, yeah. because this car owner is connecting to the car on the app. You can see what is the cost, what is the benefits of smart charging. It's the same as an Uber. If I step in the taxi drive, uh, taxi car, in the, especially in a foreign country, I am sure I will be ripped off by the taxi driver. I need to negotiate. Also in Amsterdam. Huh? Also in Amsterdam. <laughs> I need to negotiate the price. I don't like it. I don't know if it takes me around the whole world to come to this uh, place. In India, I had experience that the taxi driver was saying, oh, the hotel is very far, and it was just across the street, and he made a U-turn around <laughs> two kilometers or three kilometers just to bring me around. But OK, on the Uber, I see, or on the Bolt, I see on the app, I will take this road, it's so many kilometers, and this is my price approximately. So it gives you certainty. Exactly the same models will be developed for charging and for electric grid. It will be very clear to the car owner. I connect here, it will cost me that much. If I wait 20 more minutes, it could cost me half of the price. If I allow vehicle to grid uh, for my car, I can be even paid, not uh, even uh, it will cost me nothing. I will be even paid. So all these things will be rolled out, and then you make a decision. It's your personal decision, of course. So this is for the, at, this, at this moment not yet prepared, but I'm, I think in the future we see very rapid growth, very facilitated. The blockchain can play a role. Yeah. If I play, if I talk about peer to peer, if I say my car will feed your house, it needs to be calculated how far this house is, how many losses are there, how many transformers are in the way, how many converters are there, and all these things has to be calculated. But this will be, everything will be done. So this is the future, and uh, the user uh, at this moment cannot even imagine how far it can be uh, reached. Yeah, uh, on this, uh, some news. The Dutch Consumer Authority um, made a statement that there has to be price transparency for electric vehicle drivers I the think somewhere process. in December 2020. Yeah. Uh, if that's realistic, maybe, well, uh, first quarter in 2021. Uh, but uh, this is really pushed by uh, regulation that there has to be price transparency for, uh, uh, for the charging. Yeah, I think it's very important because a lot of people, especially if, if, if you're on a charger abroad and you're scanning your car, you have no idea what you're going to pay later. Sometimes you are charged per kilowatt hour, sometimes it's by time, sometimes it's by power, sometimes it's by some number nobody can make <laughs> sense of. So I, I think this transparency is very important, especially when looking at the transition en masse. Uh, I think we will take one more question, and the question is, um, it's about cost, because I think everybody is very sensitive to cost. We'll see all these new technologies as transition to electric mobility. So the question we have is, with all these technologies, make transportation and mobility in the future cheaper? Why it might be sustainable, does it come at the cost of all the consumers having to shell out? What do you yeah, think? One example, um, uh, cost reduction is always uh, uh, in focus uh, for us and uh, at ALAT we are very aware when we apply an extra standard or uh, um, quality specs it, it increases the costs uh, but we often do this from a, a broader perspective one a clear example is cybersecurity um, to have specification certification program for cybersecurity increases costs on the charger and in the end the consumer pays for this. Mm. But we also calculated that um, if we have a large number of electric vehicles, really a large number, 100,000, 200,000, 1 million electric vehicles, and there is a cyber attack, and all the cars are switched on or switched off yeah. at the same time. You can blow up the grid yeah. or people can't go to the uh, to their office uh, in the morning or their um, uh, their data, their privacy is um, uh, heard. Uh, so, yes, we're adding a little bit of extra costs for cybersecurity, but in the end, in the broader it perspective, benefits. It's the right thing to do. Are there other perspectives on the cost? Yeah, for our perspective, we uh, 
of course, the hyperfocus on the fish she is actually enabling us to reduce the battery size. So look at uh, the chart, the range we get on the DWRTP cycle compared to a Tesla Model S, which is sort of the same sedan size vehicle as Elijah One, uh, also same price point uh, 10 years ago uh, the Model S had. You see that the Model S at uh, the P100D had uh, 100 kilowatt hours of battery needed for 500 kilometers of, uh, of WRTP range. Now we have 60 kilowatt hours of battery having more range. Yes. So actually what we want to do is to reduce uh, the, the watt hours per kilometer driven, so the efficiency, in order to decrease the battery size. If you decrease battery size, there is sort of a lightweight cycle which you go in as a car manufacturer that the parts can be lighter because the battery is less, they can make the battery even, even smaller, so it's called a lightweight cycle. And using this lightweight cycle, we make the car extremely uh, lightweight. We are at uh, 1250 kilograms for the whole vehicle, now for the, for the lighter one. If you look at future models we want to develop, and we're already thinking about that, you look at, for example, a smaller car like the Sion, the, the, the Sona Motors, uh, one yeah. of our, uh, uh, I wouldn't say competitors, but one of our great partners actually in, in Germany, developing also a small vehicle. Um, we also want to go there, but then with a radical focus on efficiency, so really yeah. slashing the efficiency. Yeah. I think Sona Motors is at one, 150 watt hours per kilometer. We want to be at, at 75, so half that. And that's going to be a game changer lo looking at uh, the amount of energy a vehicle can consume. Uh, there is more battery uh, used for, 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 for grid services. But actually, essentially, we want to actually make the battery as small as possible for, for some use cases. But then in the end, it's really, it's, there is no one, one, one solution fits all. Uh, and we really focus on, uh, on making that efficiency happen. I think that's a very interesting point because normally, you know, in, in our calculations, we use a rule of thumb that one mm -hmm. kilowatt hour for a car will give you five kilometers. And when I first I saw the specification, I was like, did they make a typo there in their energy mm -hmm. consumption? Because it was very low compared to the normal rule of thumb. And then they realized there was a lot of efforts yeah. put into the technology That's to crazy. make it more energy efficient, which is eventually going to reduce the cost. But there is a lot of skepticism we face, even from the academic world, that what we do is not possible. But we have people like Alko Hoekstra behind Lighty. We have people like Mike Steinbuch, really the, the professors, they helped us get here, right? It's the technology developed to yourself, the technology developed in Eindhoven. So it's possible. Yeah, uh, we just need to show it. Um, yeah, when I saw it was it was WTP rated, and yeah, it, it's, yeah. It's, it's 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 a technology, the next step of energy efficiency for cars. Yeah. So um, thank you very much for all your answers. I think it was very interesting discussions. Um, um, for the audience, I know that there are far more questions than what we could cover. I, I guess you could share these questions with uh, some of our speakers later on, if you, and you can get in touch with them uh, to to discuss these points. Uh, thank you very much for joining uh, this afternoon for this event. Um, um, I hope it, it, it opened up some new ideas, maybe it changed some of your existing ideas. I think the, the, the reason for these debates and discussion is to, is, is to open up your thinking. And maybe now if you see somebody who says uh, there's a chicken and egg problem, or if somebody, if they say <laughs> that uh, electric cars are core power cars, you know what to say in response. <laughs> so thank you very much for tuning in. Have a nice evening. And uh, yeah, thank you once again for joining in. And I thank all the speakers also for joining in this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Okay.